Welcome to this class on Plant Select Grasses, Vines, Shrubs, and Trees. The instructor is Pat Hayward, the director of Plant Select. For additional information on these plants, refer to the Plant Select website at plantselect.org. My name is Pat Hayward. I'm director of Plant Select. And I wanted to start first with talking about what Plant Select is. And it's this unique collaboration of Denver Botanic Gardens, Colorado State University, and horticultural professionals in the region. And our goal is to introduce and promote and make available really amazing plants that are vibrant, resilient, and durable for this region. And that's our point, is a durable for this region. This is the region we're talking about. It goes from Montana down to northern New Mexico. When we select plants, we look for them to have a long season of interest and beauty, to perform under low water conditions, but it, they don't have to all be drought resistant, but we like them to be adaptable to a wide range of garden conditions. We all have many different conditions. Resilience to our challenging climate and non-invasive is something very important, and we would like them to be unique. So those are what we look for when we choose our plants. All the plants are trialed at both Denver Botanic Gardens at Chatfield and at Colorado State University. And Plant Select is this collaboration and just wanted to show you that it includes propagators, retail garden centers, wholesalers, mail order companies, seed sellers, and even landscape professionals. So we have a wide range of collaborators. So this presentation is going to be about grasses, vines, shrubs, and trees. Plant Select is 127 plants in the program, and about a third of them fall into this category. And these are sort of the bones of the garden. These are the things that are going to be lasting for years and years. So you want to make sure you make some really nice choices. And we'll start with the grasses. Grasses have this beautiful movement, and they give you such interest and beauty in the fall and into winter. And we forget about that in the summer, in the heat of all the color of everything. But putting grasses in is so important for the rest of the season in your garden. I want to start first with Blonde Ambition Blue Gramma Grass. This was introduced in 2011, and it has become the best performer of all the plant select plants at all of our demo gardens. We have about 75 demonstration gardens throughout the region. Colorado and, and multiple states, and this was the number one performer at low altitudes, high altitudes, and mid-range. It is a selection of a native blue gramma grass. It's like blue gramma on steroids. It's two to three feet tall, two feet wide, and those seed heads are two inches long, and they are stunning. They're blonde, and they hold up for a long period of time. Uh, this was one of the original plants actually found in New Mexico. We think maybe it's a hybrid with some other grass that was out there. Named by David Salmon, who selected it, called Blonde Ambition. This is at Denver Botanic Gardens in a mass planting. Interesting way to use it mixed in with annuals, giving that flow and that movement. Those seed heads will just float and flutter in the breeze. And another way to use it is in a native enhanced planting. This is in a median in Fort Collins where they're doing drought tolerant native plantings and using Blonde Ambition amongst native shrubs and a few perennials to just add this year long interest. It's very adaptable. It can take it super dry. It can take it with water. I think it stays the most compact on the lower end of the water, but don't cut the water off. I think it needs some water to really maintain that presence. So Blonde Ambition really can't go wrong with that one. Another grass in the program is called Korean Feather Grass. This grass was particularly selected because it does well in shade, and not many grasses do well in shade. It's got these large plumes of very fluffy flowers. About midsummer, this is an earlier grass, and this is growing in full shade at Denver Botanic Gardens. You can see it's a little more open, but it performs really, really well. It can take it actually in dry shade. If you put it in sun, I think it needs a little more water to keep that full look to it. So Korean feather grass, about three to four feet tall in shade and about two feet tall in full sun. And look at that, those plumes are just amazing midsummer. This would be in a fairly watered garden condition. But again, it will adapt to lower water if needed. So Korean feather grass. 
The newest of the grasses is a selection of a Texas grass. It's called Muhlenbergia reversionii. It's part of our new series of undaunted plants coming from Lauren Springer Ogden of her, you know, of her book called The Undaunted Gardener. And this is at Denver Botanic Gardens in late summer. This is probably early August. Look at those fluffs of pink. This is a really unusual color and form for an ornamental grass for Colorado. It is quite drought tolerant. I find with a little more water, you get the more fullness of the flowers, but it will perform under low water conditions. The foliage itself is very fine textured and short, maybe six to eight inches tall just for the leaves. So not until it goes to bloom in August do you get the height of about 18 inches to two feet and about just as wide. This is Gardens at Kendrick Lake in Lakewood. You can see goldenrod. There's blonde ambition blue grandma grass behind it. This is probably in mid-August, early August at Kendrick Lake Gardens. Backlit, oh, if you could do the backlighting, just fantastic shot. And this is in November. This was at Denver Botanic Gardens. It maintains that presence throughout the winter. Such a neglected time in the garden, and we're always so thankful to see anything out there. And the third grass is one of the biggest of the grasses. This is giant sacaton. This is a six to eight foot tall grass that gets six feet wide, so a bold grass. This is such a fabulous plant when you want to fill a spot. You've got that difficult spot, it's kind of hot and dry, and you can just put one big statement, put it out by the mailbox or, you know, just where you just need a focal point. Monster plant, and when the wind starts blowing, those will just blow in the breeze. It is a native of New Mexico, so it's very drought tolerant, and we're finding it's super cold hardy for us too. I'd put it at about a zone 4B, wouldn't go too high into the mountains but just a little bit. This is at the Denver Botanic Gardens, and when you can give it a spot that it can have its full glory like that, make it the focal point. Don't even try to have it compete with anything else. In the spring, early spring, you'll want to cut it back just as far as you can. All of these, let them go through the winter and cut back as low as you possibly can each year so the new growth will start coming up. We have a few finds in the program, and one is an annual. And we don't often do annuals in Plant Select, but because this is so amazing, we couldn't pass it up. So this is called a Ruby Moon Hyacinth Bean Vine, and it blooms these lavender purple blooms. It sets those purple seed pods. It's doing all of this at once, and it grows. That's about 12 feet tall. It needs some water because it is an annual. It grows pretty fast, but it's so easy to grow and you can collect your own seed. It's actually edible, I've not tried that, but you can collect your own seed and grow them again next year and share them with friends and neighbors. Look at the color of those pods. So a great annual vine that's a little bit unusual but really loves our conditions, and you can grow yourself and share with friends. So that's called Ruby Moon. Honeysuckles, there's a, quite a few different honeysuckles available at garden centers. This is one called Kinsley's Ghost. And it's grown for the leaves, not for the flowers. All the other honeysuckles are grown for those tubular, showy flowers. These are the silver, almost looks like eucalyptus. And that's what it's grown for. It's these clasping bracts, and the little yellow flowers are in the center. And once it gets going and it gets established, the whole plant will just glow this silver. And th these are the flowers. They're, they're fragrant and they do attract pollinators, but the plant is really grown for that silvery foliage. You want to let it get established and get going before it comes to its full glory. On the right is at Denver Botanic Gardens along one of their walkways. We actually have a grape in the program, an edible grape. There's not a lot of cold hardy, really good table grapes for our region. And there was a breeder named Norman Swenson and he developed a series of grapes, and this one was called St. Teresa Seedless. And it's a beautiful vine. You can use it just as a vine, and then it happens to bear this fabulous fruit at the end of the summer. It's a red table grape, and the seeds are little tiny things like grape nuts. That's where the name comes from, and they're completely edible and chewable, but it's a delicious grape. Great bearer for, for our region, which we find difficult some years to get good grapes but beautiful foliage as well, so St. Teresa's seedless grape. In shrubs and trees, 
These are the bones of the garden. You want to make sure that you've got a good selection, interest for different seasons, for different structure, different shapes. So we have quite a few in the program. And the first one I wanted to start with was fern bush. And fern bush, even when it's not in bloom, is beautiful. It looks like little ferns. The, each leaflet looks like a little tiny fern. But it's very drought tolerant. It comes from New Mexico. It can grow in a watered garden. It can grow in a xeriscape with very little water. Here you see it growing with yuccas and rabbit brush and perfectly happy. And it's a great pollinator plant. Want to help the bees. We know we're having so many problems with bees. It is a bee magnet. And so it's wonderful for doing that. And on the left, we see the plant just in foliage. And it holds those leaves into winter. They kind of shrink up a little bit, but it'll have some greenery throughout winter as well. We chose this little dwarf blue rabbit brush because no one knew about it. The little blue rabbit brush has been around for years and years, but everyone thinks of the great big ones and we don't have room for the big ones or they get kind of woody and kind of messy looking. This is the perfect one for a garden. Gets about 12 to 18 inches tall and about two feet wide. There's two areas in Colorado where this grows natively and our growers know where those two secret spots are and they collect the seed and they produce this one called Baby Blue. And it is just stunning all summer long. And then at the end of summer, it blooms just like the regular rabbit brush. So it's one of those things that people don't know about. And this one, you can cut it way back if you want to, but it'll never get woody like the big ones do. So Baby Blue Rabbit Brush has a place in most, most gardens that are on the lower water and a little bit drier, but it maintains that blue all summer long. Another yellow flowering plant is Spanish Gold Broom. This blooms very early in the summer, so this might bloom in late April and May, depending on the year. It's about a zone five, about three to four feet tall, four to five feet wide. When it's not blooming, it has a, a different kind of texture. It's kind of a twiggy, but it's a bright green twiggy look. So it's a different look throughout the year, and it's evergreen the stems stay green throughout the winter. So then in early summer, you get this burst of gold, and then it'll be green the rest of the year. You can kind of see closely little tiny leaves on the thin stems. This is it in winter. So it's different, but it is a present. It's, it's an evergreen present. Apache plume is a southwestern native shrub. It can get quite large. What I find beautiful about this is if you water it, it gets loaded with flowers, and if you don't water it at all, once it's established, it'll still bloom. So it is really adaptable, but it flowers and fruits at the same time. So you have these white flowers and these pink plumes all at the same time, all throughout summer. This is in a garden that gets some moderate water, but look at the amount of seed heads on that. It's just stunning. And again, you can see how it's flowering and fruiting and flowering and fruiting at the same time. One of the prettiest combinations I saw with this plant was pulling that burgundy, see the burgundy in the leaves, pulling that burgundy out like with a red-leafed barberry or a red-leafed smoke bush, and that combination of the burgundy, and this was one of the best combinations I've seen in shrubs. Red yucca, we never thought these were hardy for us. They're listed as like a zone six or seven. We thought, oh, they're not hardy, and all of a sudden people started using them, and we found out they were hardy for us probably a zone five. This is a Texas native, and it's a plant native to dry conditions, but with monsoons. So we have found that if this gets some deep watering in July, it'll keep blooming. They start in late May, bloom throughout the summer with a couple of deep waterings during the heat of the summer. Wonderful for hummingbirds, other pollinators. The foliage is kind of yucca-like, and then the flowers are cascades. Uh, these spikes and the hummingbirds will use these as perches. So if you have hummingbirds in your area, they will find these and use it as a perch and feed and perch at the same time. I wanted to put this in. This is a mock orange. Now there's lots of mock oranges in the trade. This one, Cheyenne, was selected the Cheyenne Experiment Station. And I wanted to show this picture because this is dead of winter. And if you look at this sign, these plants were planted in 1932. They've had very, very little care taken of them. They basically don't get any water. And they are growing in Cheyenne, Wyoming with the wind and the cold and the snow. 
and look at those plants. So from 1932 with little care, and then this is a younger plant, but it's a, it's a zone three to four plant, very cold hardy, very fragrant blossoms in early summer, and one of the most durable of the shrubs. So Cheyenne mock orange would be top pick for any garden just to have some of them in there. And when it's in bloom, it's just fabulous. We have a hybrid rose in the program, and this was brought to us by a breeder named John Starnes. He was a famous Denver rose breeder, and this selection was chosen because of its fragrance. It's an old-fashioned, large shrub rose. This was trialed at Fort Collins Wholesale Nursery, and they had a whole lot of his varieties. And he, we wanted to find one that was cold hardy, that was fragrant, that had pretty foliage. This was the one chosen out of all the selections he brought to them to trial called Ruby Voodoo, and it is a large growing shrub. It does need a bit of water, like any kind of rose, uh, but look at those flowers, and if you could smell it, you, you would go, wow, that's unusual. Come to find out, the genetics involved in fragrance and black spot susceptibility are really closely related. So as they were breeding out the susceptibility to black spot, they were breeding out the fragrance. Here, it's not so much a problem with black spot. So that's why this is great for us, not so much in other parts of the country, because it does get black spot. And if you are watered a lot and it's in a humid area in your garden, it might have some problems. But we put it in drier parts, and it did fabulous. One of the trees in the program, this is called Hot Wings May. I'm seeing it everywhere. It's like the tree is in bloom. Some years, this will bloom for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's actually not the bloom. This is the seed pod. And that's why it's called Hot Wings, because the seed pods, brilliant red for a month or two in late May, June, even into July some years. Uh, the tree can be grown as a multi-stem also grown as single stem. So depending on what you're looking for, if you want a multi-stem small tree, gets maybe 20 feet tall, 25 feet tall, about 15 feet wide. But you want a multi-stem, make sure you start with a multi-stem. If you want a single stem tree like this, make sure you start with a single stem because you can't go the other way once you get going. Just amazing color on a small tree. The Russian hawthorn was selected because it was so cold hardy and so adapted to our climate. It is a large spreading tree. This is in early summer. It'll bloom. I will warn you, flowers on all hawthorns stink. So don't put it by your front door or on your patio where you're going to be spending time for that period of time while it's in bloom. But it also attracts lots of flies and pollinators that like that produce fruit end of summer. In the winter, it holds that fruit for quite a while, so it has great winter interest. And it has fall color as well, um, but it is a large spreading tree. You'd want to give it plenty of room. I wanted to show this because this is an unusual tree. This is called Seven Sunflower. This blooms in September. We don't have many trees or shrubs that bloom in September, so it blooms very late in the season. Super fragrant. It's in the honeysuckle family. So has this great fragrance. Usually it's most beautiful as a, a multi-stem tree, usually how you'll find them. This is at Denver Botanic Garden. And look at the bark. So all the time in the winter and the rest of the season, when it's not in bloom, you have this fabulous bark. And I would recommend pruning it up so that you can really see that bark because it's very attractive. And on the left, the blossoms, great for attracting pollinators late in the season. Didn't have a picture of it, but after the blooms are done, the petals fall off and the bracts left behind turn red. So you have about a month of white flowers going to these red bracts right before frost hits. It's a wonderful fragrance, so this is one you'd want to put uh, by a patio, about 15 to 18 feet tall. And we have one conifer in the program, and we chose this. This is called Weeping White Spruce because it's narrow and elegant and evergreen, and sometimes you just don't have room for a widespreading tree. This is a zone three spruce tree. It does have that bluish cast to it, and it will grow a foot to two feet a year. It can grow in low water, it can grow in moderate water, very adaptable, but it once established, this thing will grow pretty fast. It has beautiful cones. They're quite decorative. I wanted to show this picture of a younger plant, but look what happens when it snows. Those tall, narrow conifers 
are meant for snowy places. So the snow hits it and just falls off. There's no breaking of branches because the branches are all cascading down already. So a fabulous, really interesting conifer for our region. And if you want to learn more, you want to adapt some plant lists for your own garden, come to plantselect.org and you will find in the plant search area, you can create your own customized plant list. Select the benefits you're looking for and it'll give you a list of what would be some good choices. You can also download free designs, Xeriscape designs. Take these, make them your own. You can adapt a plant list to fit your situation or copy it directly. One of the best things I think on this website is this new booklet. I'll go to Publications, Guide to Plants, and you can flip through this book that shows all the plants in the Plant Select program.